Hi, my name is Wendy Crone. I'm a professor in the Department of Engineering Physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm also Director of Education for the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center on Nanostructured Interfaces. Today I'd like to talk to you about some of the tools that scientists and engineers use to look at the nanometer size scale. The nanoscale is very small, so it's really difficult for us to work at that scale. It would be easiest if we could shrink ourselves down, but that's not really possible. So instead, we use tools that are very, very small in order to work at the nanometer scale. The tools I'm going to talk about are called probe microscopes. And these are some of the tools that have made the development of nanotechnology possible. Even though the nanoscale is so small we can't see it with our eyes, or even with regular optical microscopes, these probe microscopes can actually allow us to see the nanoscale, learn about the materials at this scale, and move things around so that we can make devices. I'd like to start us with an experiment. And this experiment is something that you can do at home to learn about how probe microscopes work. I'll show you the experiment here, um, but if you're at home, you can actually um, take a refrigerator magnet, one of the thin ones that's very flexible, and make sure it's an okay magnet for you to cut up, and make, make a little probe out of it. So you're gonna slice the edge off of this refrigerator magnet, use that little piece as a probe to investigate the dark side of the magnet. You'll scan it horizontally and vertically. You'll feel something and you may even hear something as you move the probe across the, the um, magnet. Since you probably don't have a refrigerator magnet available right now, I'll show you the results of the experiment. In the short direction, you see how the probe moves up and down as you slide it along, but in the long direction, it slides smoothly. The probe is allowing you to investigate the magnetic poles on this refrigerator magnet. And from this data, you can, you can figure out how the magnetic poles are arranged. So we'll have a little quiz. So we have three choices. Choice A is a uniform pole across this magnet. Choice B is stripes of, of north and south poles. And choice C is a checkerboard pattern of the north and south poles. Let's look at the experiment again so that you can see what was happening. So you noticed in the experiment that the probe moves up and down as you slide it along in the short direction. This is because it's being repelled and attracted by north and south poles. So along the short direction, the poles are changing, so it can't be choice A. In the long direction, it slides along smoothly, so the poles are not changing in that direction. So it can't be choice C. The right answer is choice B. The north and south poles are arranged in stripes in a refrigerator magnet. Like the probes in this refrigerator magnet experiment, we actually use probe tips that are very, very small um, to do experiments at the nanoscale and to learn about nanomaterials and surfaces. In this particular case, we use a probe tip that's very, very small, just a few atoms at the end of the tip. And we use this probe to scan along a surface and investigate how the surface looks. Because the tip is so small, it can actually feel individual atoms on the surface as it scans across. This diagram shows the path that the probe takes as it scans over the surface. In this next slide, we see an image on the right that's made from scanning a tip back and forth on a copper surface. Each white dot is the top of an atom. The movie on the left gives you an idea of how this image is made. Here, a ping pong ball, in this case our tip, is being scanned over a piece of foam that has hills and valleys, like the hills of the copper atoms and the valleys in between. Now we have an idea of how we can learn about the nanoscale with these probe microscopes, which is critical for scientists to be able to do in order to um, explore the nano regime and to do nanotechnology. But beyond seeing the nanoscale, we'd also like to be able to work at the nanoscale, to manipulate things and make new devices. To do this, we can use the same sorts of probe microscopes. Instead of gliding above the surface, we can actually interact with the surface and make a bond. This bond makes it possible for us to move atoms around into new positions. In this movie, we're actually looking back at that refrigerator magnet, and now we have little magnetic particles on top of it. And then magnetic particles are being moved around with the refrigerator magnet probe. This is what Don Eigler at IBM did to make the famous quantum corral. The atoms that made up the corral are iron atoms resting on a silicon surface. Early on, the hills and valleys look like the arrangement of atoms we saw in the earlier image. But as the corral is built, the pattern inside the corral changes, 
the electrons around each atom are not staying close to their nucleus. The complete corral is forcing the surface electrons into quantum states that make it appear like a wave in a puddle after you've thrown a stone. This is actually proof of the wave nature of matter, quantum mechanics. That's a pretty cool experiment, but it'd be really nice if we could do something practical with um, moving atoms around on surfaces, like maybe data storage, for instance. In this image from Professor Franz Himsel's lab at the University of Wisconsin, we're seeing silicon atoms on gold tracks. In some places there are silicon atoms, and in other places they are missing. So if you read along a track, you would be able to read ones and zeros, which is the equivalent of digital information. By storing data atom by atom, you can get huge data densities. In this particular case, you can get 250 terabits per square inch of information onto, onto a piece of material. That's huge. On a regular CD that you would use to store music or photos, you don't get nearly as much information. In this particular CD picture, it also has tiny dots, but the, each one of these dots is many, many atoms big. You can compare these dots to a piece of hair that's shown in the center of the image, which is about 80 micrometers in diameter. The hair we can see with our eye just barely, but the individual dots on a CD are small enough that they're a blur. Even Sony's double density CD can only store 1.3 gigabytes of information, and that's on an entire CD. If you look at one square inch of that CD, you can, uh, you can store 736 megabits of information. That's um, a lot less than what we could store with atomic scale memory. With atomic scale memory, you could get more than 300,000 times more information on that one square inch. The only problem is you would have to keep your data storage device very, very cold at all times because at room temperature, atoms move around a lot. And if they move around, you would lose all of your data. Going a little bit bigger up from the atomic scale to the nanoscale makes things a little bit more practical. Your high density data storage device in um, your computer or your iPod actually has nanoscale size components. But people are trying to go even smaller into the nanoscale regime to get even higher data storage densities. One particular example is this um, project at IBM. They've created a new data storage device called the Millipede. This device also uses probe tips, actually an array of many probe tips, to create small nanoscale divots or indentations on a polymer surface. In some places there are divots and in other places they are missing, the ones and zeros of digital information. They expect this device to be available on the market in the next few years. One particular kind of probe microscope is the atomic force microscope, or AFM. The atomic force microscope can measure surfaces in a very accurate way using a probe tip mounted on a cantilever beam like a diving board. The position of the tip is monitored with a laser beam that is reflected off of the cantilever onto a detector. As the tip scans back and forth, it moves up and down with the hills and valleys of the surface, which deflects the laser beam up and down. The information is recorded on a computer. From the information collected, we can understand information about the surface. It's possible to scan any surface with an AFM, and at such high resolution, you'll find amazing things. In this particular example, we're seeing scans of a piece of hair. The image on the left illustrates how the AFM tip scans along the circumference of the hair to build up an image. Example images are shown on the right, which give you an idea of how rough the surface of hair actually is. The AFM microscope can also be used to um, measure other things other than the hills and valleys of a surface. For instance, it can measure things like friction. This polymer surface is flat, as the left-hand image shows, because it's all one uniform color. But if you use the AFM probe to measure friction, a patchwork pattern appears. You find that different regions of the surface have different frictional properties as the tip scans along. The tip can feel forces from a physical object, but it can also feel other forces like electric charge. In this particular picture, there are four pads on a surface. The yellow one in the upper right-hand corner looks higher than the blue pads, but it's not. This image is telling you how electrical charge is distributed on the surface. The pad with the highest elevation has the most charge. To recap, we've talked about the tools that scientists and engineers use to work at the nanoscale. These are important tools for nanotechnology. They allow us to be able to see at the nanoscale, to characterize nanoscale materials and surfaces, 
and to move materials around on surfaces in order to create devices. To learn about these tools and others, please visit our website.